You've seen how arrays are a great choice for storing data in a particular order, such as days of the week or temperatures for a town over time. So a great choice for keeping data in the order you created it and also good for storing duplicate items. But reading items from the array based on their position, their index can often be problematic and sometimes even dangerous. Let's look at an example of this. Here's an array called employee storing Taylor Swift, Singer and Nashville. Now I've told you with my variable name, this is information about an employee. So you could probably try and guess what those parts mean. You could say employee zero is probably their name. Employee one will be their job title and employee two would be their location, where they live or where they work. But this has a couple of problems. First, we can't really be sure that employee two is their location. It could be the password. It's a very weak password, but it could be the password. Second, there's no guarantee that employee two is even there particularly because we made employee a variable. And so this kind of code would cause problems. Employee remove at one, remove singer from the array. That would make Nashville move down, become item number one. So it'd say job title is Nashville, which makes no sense. And even worse, employee two no longer exists. There are only two items. There is no third item anymore. So our code will crash, which is just bad. Swift has a solution for this called dictionaries. Arrays store their items at 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, a billion, whatever. They're indexes, indices in the array, the positions in the array. Dictionaries don't do that. They let us decide how we store our data, how to look for it and where it is. For example, we could rewrite our previous code like this. Name is Taylor Swift. Job is singer, location is Nashville. I recommend you split it up across multiple lines so you can see what's really happening here. Again, square brackets start and end. Then name, colon, Taylor Swift, comma. Job, colon, singer, comma. Location, comma, Nashville. So it's clear to find what is each value. Now, we, it's much clearer. Name is Taylor Swift. Location is Nashville. Now, Swift calls all the text on the left, name, job, and location, the keys to the dictionary. And the values on the right, Taylor Swift, Singer, and Nashville, they're the values of the dictionary. And when it comes to reading values out of the dictionary, you just use the same keys you made when creating it. For example, we could say I want to read employee to name, which would be Taylor Swift, or employee to job, or employee to location. If you try the playground, you're going to see all sorts of interesting warnings like this. It's big warnings here in yellow. Uh, it's saying expression implicitly coerced from string question mark to any. Uh, worse, if you run the code, you'll see it doesn't output what you expect. It's an output optional Taylor Swift, optional singer, and optional Nashville. Oops, down here. What gives? <laughs> well, think about this. If I had said print employee to password or employee to status or employee to manager, this is all valid Swift code. Our keys are strings. I'm asking for different kinds of strings and it's valid. This is good Swift, but we're trying to read keys in our dictionary that don't actually exist. Now Swift could just crash here, right? Like it would do if you read uh, the index from an array doesn't exist. But that'd make it very, very hard to work with. At least if you had uh, an array of uh, 10 items, you knew it was safe to read items zero through nine. You could read the count and say, okay, I've got 10, do zero, one, two, three, four, up to nine. Uh, and so indices are more or less safe as long as you stay within the rules of how many there are. And so Swift provides an alternative here. When you access data inside a dictionary like this one, it'll tell us you might get a value back, but you also might get back nothing at all. And Swift calls these optional because the existence of data, is it there or not, is entirely optional. It might be there, it might not. 
and it'll even warn you as you write the code, albeit in this very obscure way. Uh, it's saying to you, really, this da data might not actually be there. Are you sure you want to print it out? Bit risky. Now, optionals are a, a fairly complex issue that we're going to go into later in detail. For now, though, I want to show you a simpler approach. When dealing with a dictionary like uh, name, job, and location, you can provide a default value to use if the key does not exist. And so I could say, read the name. If I can't, send back a default value of unknown, like that. And I'll do again, default is unknown, and default is unknown. And so with that in place, we will always get a string back. We'll either get back the name string or the text unknown. And so it'll no longer be optional Taylor Swift, but now it'll be real, just Taylor Swift by itself. Now, all the examples we've used so far have had strings for keys and strings for values, but you can use other kinds of data as much as you want to. For example, we could uh, track whether uh, students in a class have graduated from school using strings for names for the keys and booleans for their graduation status. We could say, uh, let has graduated equals a dictionary of, let's do uh, Eric has not graduated, let's do Maeve, oops, here has, and then we'll do Otis has not. So it's now a string boolean dictionary or we could track when Olympics took place along with the locations. We could say, uh, let Olympics be a dictionary of 2012 was London, 2016 was Rio de Janeiro, uh, like that. And then 2021, Tokyo. 2020 officially, but 2021 in practice, I'm not sure which one's more accurate, <laughs> um, but it, it's now an integer. String dictionary, integers for keys, strings for values. And we can now read values out using integers. We could say things like uh, print, I want Olympics 2012 with a default value of unknown. Give me a string back again, because the values are all strings. You can, if you want to, create an empty dictionary using whatever explicit types you want to store, and then set keys one by one. So it could say something like, uh, var heights is a string int dictionary. And I'll say heights uh, Yao Ming, he's 229. And then heights uh, Shaquille O'Neal uh, equals 216. And heights LeBron James is 206. Now notice how when we make this thing, we're saying string colon int. It's a dictionary, we've got to specify the key and the value type here. String for keys, int for values. Now because each dictionary item, each thing we store in a dictionary, must exist at a specific key. This exists at Yao Ming, it exists at LeBron James and similar. It exists at a particular key. Dictionaries don't allow duplicate keys to exist. Instead, if you set a value for a key that already exists, it will overwrite that with the new value and discard the old value. For example, if you were chatting with a friend about superheroes and supervillains, you might storm in a dictionary. You might say, uh, var arch enemies is a string, string dictionary. And we'll do arch enemies of Batman is the Joker. What arch enemies of uh, Superman is Lex Luthor. Now, your friend ardently, passionately disagrees that the Joker is Batman's arch enemy. They much prefer the Penguin. You can just say arch enemies, Batman equals Penguin. And it'll overwrite the value belonging to the Batman key. Now, finally, just like arrays and other types of data we've seen so far, Dictionaries come with some useful functionality built in. You're going to want to use in your own code. 
and it's just like array. You can use count, how many items do I have, and remove all. They both exist for dictionaries and work in just like they do for arrays.